Hi, everyone. Welcome to a bonus episode of Feminism, Fascism, and the Future. This is Lori Essig, and I decided to devote my feminist theory class this year to the global attack on gender, gender theory, and gender studies. We read a lot of great articles, and you can access the reading list on our website if you want, and we'll keep adding to it. Anyway, my students decided to look at the anti-gender movement in Mexico, Germany, Florida, and Vermont. I hope you'll agree that they did a pretty great job. We'll start right here in Vermont, then make our way to Florida, Germany, and Mexico. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex, a junior at Middlebury College. Hi, everyone. My name is Marin. I am also a junior at Middlebury College. And I'm Ani, and I'm a freshman at Middlebury College. We produced the segment of the podcast for Feminism, Fascism, and the Future with our professor Lori Essig as part of our feminist theory class. And on that note, you know what I love? Vermont. Oh, yes. The People's Republic of Vermont. Yes. Eating Ben and Jerry's on a warm summer's day. Oh, my gosh. I need some Cherry Garcia flavor right now. Really, Alex? It's like 30 degrees outside. <laughs> It's never too cold for some Ben and Jerry's. No, literally. Vermont, to me and most people, is often touted as a liberal utopia. We have Bernie Sanders as a representative, after all. We will not tolerate policies which are racist and sexist and homophobic. How fabulous is that? Burlington, the largest city in Vermont, sits about an hour north of Middlebury and will be the focus of our local segment on the war against gender ideology. Vermont is the least religious state in the United States. Only 23% of Vermonters say they are very religious, which is only half of what it is in the South. And without a strong religious movement against gender ideology, Vermont seems to be blissfully queer. In fact, Vermont has one of the largest and most successful Drag Queen Story Hour chapters in the country. Alex and I had the pleasure of meeting and interviewing Emoji Nightmare, a local Vermont drag queen, activist, and co-founder of the Vermont chapter of Drag Queen Story Hour. We were able to discuss the origins, ins and outs, and joys of Drag Story Hour with Emoji. Let's let Emoji tell us a little bit about herself and the origins of Drag Story Hour. So, Emoji, would you like to first introduce yourself? You can say your name, your pronouns, um, and talk a little bit about what Drag Story Hour is and your role in the organization. Sure, yeah. Emoji Nightmare. I use she, her pronouns when I'm in Emoji and then Justin, um, they, them, outside of drag. Um, I live in Cambridge, Vermont. I'm the co-founder of the Vermont chapter of Drag Story Hour, and I'm also a board member for Drag Story Hour National. That's awesome. So do you want to talk about how you got started with Drag Story Hour and just a little bit about the process, how that began? Yeah, so um, my drag counterpart at the time, Nikki Champagne, um, and I were wrapping up a project um, that was called The Tea. It was on public access television where we interviewed people, like kind of like a talk show, um, we talked to folks who were at the intersection of arts and activism, and we used our drag personas as sort of the vehicle to drive those conversations. When that project wrapped up, we were kind of coming up with projects to still be out there in front of people. Um, and um, Drag Story Hour was something that was sort of emerging on the national front. It had um, existed in San Francisco and New York City, and there was really no... You know, it was only a couple years in. It was very underground, very grassroots. And um, we thought maybe this was something we could bring to Vermont. So I reached out to the organization and they were not really prepared to build chapters yet. But um, I basically, you know, we said, we'd love to do this. Can we just do it? And um, they gave us what little what little tools they had to work with at the time. And Vermont actually ended up being the first state chapter um, in the collective family of Drag Story Hour, which now is international. It's in several countries and regions throughout the world. Um, and so it's really, it was really exciting to be kind of at the, really in the beginning stages of something that's really caught on. I was hearing Emoji mention that as a queer individual from Lamoille County, a rural part of Vermont, she wanted to make sure that Drag Story Hour wasn't primarily located in Burlington. 
I agree, because Burlington, even though as Emoji says, is small in the grand scheme of things, it does have more access to cultural programming, and her wanting to pay attention to rural Vermont is refreshing. Yeah, the People's Republic of Vermont, am I right? Emoji talked to us about how she founded Drag Story Hour with her drag counterpart at the time, Nikki Champagne, also known as Taylor Small. Small is a Vermont State House representative. I was asked by Representative Small to open the, uh, the day with a story from Drag Story Hour. So um, I read Just at Glitter. The fact that a Vermont State House representative asked a drag queen to read a children's book from Drag Story Hour as a devotion goes to show how progressive and free Vermont is of the anti-gender ideology movement. Until... And one of the representatives down in Rutland County in the Rutland 2 district who represents the town of Clarendon, uh, his name is Art Peterson, he um, posted on his social medias um, just, you know, his disgust for me and diminished me to the point that I was just a, a thing, um, wouldn't even, you know, reference me as a human, um, and encouraged his followers to um, echo their disgust with House leadership. And so I think I, I, I think that's a great example of Vermont not being immune to this sort of thing. Yes, Vermont is not completely immune to the anti-gender ideology movement. Dun, dun, dun. Exactly. It's interesting hearing Emoji originally mention the opportunity she's received to share her art as a drag artist and be embraced by the state's government to be included in moments like a devotion. And then to hear about representatives down in Rutland County calling Emoji disgusting. I guess it isn't all rainbows and unicorns and Ben and Jerry's after all. And it doesn't stop there. There are other politicians who are saying even more hateful things. It may come as a surprise to many of our listeners that Vermont's villain in the anti-gender ideology movement is a gay dude. Christopher Aaron Felker is chairman of the Vermont Republican Party and ran this year for a position on the Burlington City Council. Well, luckily, he didn't win. However, his existence is important to understanding what we are fighting against at home in Vermont. As we've learned from this podcast, every anti-gender ideology movement is unique to its place of origin. And in Vermont, the anti-gender ideology movement is often headed by members of the gay and lesbian community. We requested an interview with Felker to talk about his thoughts on gender ideology, but we never got a response back. Fortunately, as a politician, he has a strong online presence. Felker represents an interesting subset of people against trans rights and so-called gender ideology. Because he's a gay man, it seems contradictory for him to oppose trans rights. But on X, formerly known as Twitter, his feed is riddled with inflammatory transphobic posts. Felker is positioned adjacent to TERFs, trans-exclusionary radical feminists. That is, he identifies as an advocate for women and gay rights, but aggressively opposes anything that suggests that gender and sex are fluid and complex. His top pin post on X reads, I defend women's rights, women's sports, and women's spaces. I am not alone. This sentiment implicitly translates to the exclusion and denial of trans women. The deeper we drove into Felker's online presence, the stranger it got. In an interview with citizen activist Sandy Baird in 2022, Felker explained he was the founder of Vermont's LGB Alliance, a group of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people opposed to trans inclusion. I was representing a newfound organization that I founded with um, historic gay rights activist Fred Sargent, and that organization is the LGB Alliance VT, and that's what I was there um, on behalf of that day. Okay, but wait a minute. Let's go back a little bit. So there was Outright Vermont, which, which I could observe seemed to be mainly young gay people. Is that I don't true? believe they'd call themselves gay. I think that they're the groups that call themselves queer. Uh, since uh, the Pride Center of Vermont has now issued that the term gay is exclusionary. Ah, really? What's that all about? Well, there's been a schism between um, the many members of the lesbian, gay, and bisexual community and the trans, queer, and... Um, oh, really? Yes, since 2015. There's no? a schism within the LGB community okay. and here the LGB yeah. for people who are... Lesbian, gay, and bisexuals, right. and then the TQ is for trans and uh, queer. Felker has been publicly endorsed by a group called Gays Against Groomers for his campaign for the Burlington City Council. Gays Against Groomers states on their website that they oppose the sterilization and mutilation of minors, drag and pride events involving children, propagandizing youth with LGBTQ plus media and queer theory and gender ideology being taught in the classroom. They said in their endorsement of Felker, quote, 
Once elected, he will continue to advocate for parental rights in the state house and encourage parents to sue districts that are indoctrinating children. I think this is particularly troubling because Felker's rhetoric isn't isolated. He is tapping into a broader global conversation that uses fear and misinformation to mobilize this greater anti-gender movement against trans people. Calling trans people groomers recycles an old myth often used against gay men to claim they are pedophiles. Now gay men are using that slur against trans women. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? And despite Vermont's reputation for being progressive, I think this reminds us that these battles are everywhere, even in our own backyards. While Felker's views seem to cast a shadow over Vermont's liberal image, Emoji had her own perspective on him and the impact his rhetoric has had on both Drag Story Hour and how these attitudes manifest locally. Sort of the, the sounding arm of that, of that whole, you know, he's, he's the vocal one of, of that group for sure. We've been dealing with him and, and his, um, his ideas for a long time in the queer community. Um, it's a very vocal, but very small group. Um, it's going to take a lot for them to dismantle drag story hour at this point. Emoji emphasized how people like Felker are more about making noise than creating effective change. Noting despite his vocal stance, the community that supports inclusivity and diversity is much stronger. Exactly, Marin. Despite his efforts to influence public opinion and policy, Emoji described Felker's actions as more of a spectacle than a real threat. She believes that it's crucial to keep the focus on the positive impacts of initiatives like Drag Story Hour rather than giving too much power to detractors. And she mentioned something inspiring. According to Emoji, the backlash from figures like Felker has sort of inadvertently helped to increase visibility of Drag Story Hour in similar events. She says, quote, Every time they try to shut us down, we only grow stronger and more people come out to support us. I think this speaks to the resilience and proactive stance of activists in the face of the anti-gender ideology movement. That's the key takeaway, isn't it? It's not just about the challenges posed by the anti-gender ideology movement in Vermont, but about how we respond to them. I think Emoji's approach to empower and uplift, transforming what could otherwise be discouraging situations into moments of resilience and affirmation, highlights the strength of community in the face of this movement. With all the challenges Emoji highlighted, it begs the question, how do we, both as a community and members of the media, actively support initiatives like Drag Story Hour? Yeah. It's crucial to amplify the positive stories and concrete outcomes of these programs. We need to shift the focus from simply reacting to negative rhetoric like Velkers to celebrating the benefits these programs bring to communities. You're right, Marin. Showcasing the success stories and positive impact of these programs helps to counteract the harmful narratives. It shows the public the real, human side of these initiatives that often gets overshadowed by biases. Yes, but considering the positive impacts Emoji discussed, how significant do you think these educational and inclusive efforts are in transforming local perceptions about gender diversity? It's incredibly significant. Witnessing the joy in learning that Drag Story Hour brings to children can change communities' opinions. It directly challenges the baseless fears and misconceptions surrounding gender diversity. And it's not just about the broader community. It's about the constant and larger participation. As Emoji said, community visibility and support at Drag Story events play a crucial role in building counter-initiatives. It's all part of a greater cycle, isn't it? The more attempts there are to suppress these voices, the stronger and more vocal the community's response. It's inspiring to see such a dynamic reaction from supporters. That's the resilience we need, Alex. Every Drag Story Hour, all positive engagement adds to a growing momentum that's been impossible to ignore. It's this engagement from activists in the community that sustains movements like this. Considering all this, what can our listeners do to support Drag Story Hour or similar initiatives? How can someone from outside the immediate community get involved and make a difference? That's a really good point, Ani. There's a spectrum of options to engage from attending local events to digital activism. For those looking to get involved, a good start would be to connect with event organizers like Emoji or explore online resources to understand the best ways to offer support. If you go to our website, we have a link to Vermont Drag Story Hour. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ani, Alex, and Marin for your insights on Vermont's thriving queer resistance to hate. Now, before we head overseas, let's see what's going on in Florida. We fight the woke in the legislature. We fight the woke in the schools. We fight the woke in the corporations. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. 
scary, right? And did you hear that applause? These are only some of the examples of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis striking attacks against the woke agenda. And these are the kinds of politicians that are being elected into power in Florida, and they have been aiming to use the anti-gender movement to create a sense of fear in voters across the state. The anti-gender sentiment is not just in state laws. It's in the state's education system, in companies, and corporations. It is creeping and breaching out into many public spaces which are becoming heavily politicized. Hi everyone, I am Elle Fahey, a sophomore at Middlebury College. I'm Maria Soto, a sophomore at Middlebury College. I am Adriana Santiago, a junior at Middlebury College. And I am Christian Lopez, a senior at Middlebury College. In this segment, we want to shed light on the rapid rise of the anti-gender movement in Florida. Our aim is to examine the key players involved in the advocacy of the anti-gender movement in Florida and to open a space for students and teachers to share their own lived experiences in this new environment, which openly encourages hate and oppression. In this episode, we have conversations with a student and a teacher in Florida about how these laws are impacting their lives. So let's explore what's really happening and who's behind it. To help us understand, we've got Christian to help. He's been following the Alliance Defending Freedom, or the ADF, a key player in Florida's anti-gender movement. Christian, why don't you break it down for us? Sure thing. Thank you, all. Since 2015, state lawmakers have introduced more than 2,000 anti-LGBTQ plus bills. We are living in a state of emergency. People are actually openly spewing their, their ideals of hate, trying to find more and more ways to discriminate against our community. Investigating gender-affirming care for transgender children as child abuse. These bills target health care, bathroom access, the ability for trans kids to play sports, ID laws, and same-sex marriage. These bills are an outright attack on the rights of trans Americans. All right, let's get into the big picture. From the Stonewall Uprising in 1969 to the legalization of same-sex marriage at the federal level in 2015, the LGBTQ plus struggle for equity has made remarkable progress over the past half century. But even though there have been huge gains, there has nearly always been a counter movement to LGBTQ rights. Since 1994, one of the biggest opponents to LGBTQ rights is the Alliance for Defending Freedom, or the ADF a Christian right-wing legal group with a lot of influence. And when I say a lot, I mean they've got deep pockets and some powerful friends. According to SourceWatch, the ADF has had $104 million to spend on everything from anti-abortion to anti-LGBTQ initiatives. Ron DeSantis, the current governor of Florida and former presidential candidate, is a big fan of the ADF. He even appointed one of the ADF's senior council members, Dennis Harley, to the Florida Faith-Based and Community-Based Advisory Council in 2021. The council works as a formal advisor to the executive office of the governor and to the legislator in Florida. In a statement posted on the ADF's website following her appointment to the council, Harley vowed to, quote, protect life and continue to ensure Floridians and Americans across the country can freely live out their faith. So yeah, they're plugged in. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Matt Sharp, and I'm senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom. Senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom. Senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom. I'm senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom. Senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom in support of this bill. But let's talk about what the ADF is really about. They say they want to protect freedom, but whose freedom exactly? The ADF has been extremely active in the proposal and implementation of legislation within the United States, having proposed more than 130 bills in states across the country, finding success in having over 30 of these bills signed into law in the year 2022 alone. Their legal strategy involves challenging LGBTQ plus rights and reproductive freedom, not just in Florida, but across the country. Remember the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade? The ADF was involved in that. Same with the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, which allowed businesses to refuse service to LGBTQ plus people on religious grounds. Last year, Mike Johnson, an ADF spokesperson and litigation attorney, became Speaker of the House of Representatives. Recently, the ADF has joined forces with the Right Wing Heritage Foundation and the Family Policy Alliance to create the Promise to America's Children. According to their website, their plan is to beat the radical left by standing against gender theory and what they call critical race theory, which basically means any educational materials about slavery and its afterlife. So when ADF talks about gender ideology, they're framing it as some kind of threat to the natural order of things. They argue for a strict binary view of gender and want to stop kids from learning about anything that challenges that. But let's be real. That kind of thinking has real consequences. It's not just about what happens in the courts. It affects people's lives in schools, hospitals, and workplaces. 
the legislation that the ADF promotes has tangible impacts on the lives of LGBTQ plus individuals, women, and other marginalized groups. Wow, Chris, ADF seems to be a really scary opponent, and unfortunately, they aren't the only ones mobilizing against this so-called gender ideology. Joining them in their hateful fight is Moms for Liberty. Moms for Liberty? Who are they? Moms for Liberty is an anti-government organization founded in January of 2021 by Tiffany Justice and Tina Deskovich. On their website, Moms for Liberty's mission statement declares that they are quote unquote, dedicated to fighting for the survival of America by unifying, educating, and empowering parents to defend their parental rights at all levels of government. Moms for Liberty has been set on taking over the public school system and banning books which contain LGBTQ plus themes from school libraries. It seems like they want to enforce their own parental rights onto kids that are not their own. Is this not hypocrisy at its finest, folks? That sounds horrible, Adriana. What's interesting about all this, Maria, is that Bridget Ziegler's own kids don't even go to school in the public school system in Florida. What is interesting enough, Adriana, is that kids actually do care about politics, especially when DeSantis's policies have served to censor educational content and silence students' voices for years. Although the Don't Say Gay bill primarily targets K-12 education, its effects have been evidently felt even in the state's most prestigious universities. That's why I decided to interview a student who served as a representative in the University of Florida's student body. She brings firsthand insight into how laws like Don't Say Gay shape the student's experience and raises concerns for the future. I've been a student at the University of Florida six months, seven months, something like that. As you know, the Don't Say Gay bill or the Parental Rights and Education Act was passed in 2022 and has expanded into high school education over the past year. How has the bill influenced your day-to-day life, how you act in class, how you exist in the classroom, and in a larger school environment overall? I mean, it's definitely had a really big impact on the UF campus with just like a lot of like protests and a lot of people just very much opposing it because it's supposed to be like a safe space and a protected space, and it's definitely not. And while it's not something that affected me personally, it's something that affected a lot of people personally that I care about. So seeing them like now struggling to get any sort of affirming care that they might need or to just be able to truly feel like safe in these spaces where they should be safe is definitely a problem. Yeah. Do you ever feel like anyone that you know must like censor themselves in order to protect themselves from like any backlash from society or from like, the education board or anything like that like do you ever feel like you can't talk about the lgbtq or like anything like that in your classroom or just overall like if it comes up and and casual conversation yeah so overall like for like classrooms i know that there are definitely a lot of advances trying to be made i'm in like a law and society class right now and so we were discussing like there's just like the intersectionality and he was telling us he's like you know i can give you the very baseline definitions of this stuff but i really can't go into it too much because of the new censorship and stuff and then putting a lot of people into these higher up offices that are very much like desantis sided and aligning i guess so we do have to be pretty careful a lot of people like really want to speak out against DeSantis and we really want to pass stuff that has to do with going against that. But it's really hard because then that stuff gets sent up like literally to the president, to the provost and stuff like that. And Yeah. What has the school done to like ensure that they're not crossing the line with the act, but they're also not supporting students? Do you feel like students have been supported or continue to be supported? I think to some extent, it kind of feels like at this point, as far as like LGBTQ plus affairs and such goes, they haven't taken stuff away, but they haven't really done stuff to like add to it either. At least in student government, like there is like an LGBTQ plus like affairs cabinet where through that they try and they do like kind of like events and stuff like that. They hand out pronoun pins. We still have like the Pride Student Union is one of our big orgs on campus. So in that sense, I think that stuff isn't necessarily being taken away. But then it does also feel like uh, almost all of those organizations are pretty like strictly student run. And there's students that are doing those things and they're not really commenting or like saying too much or expressing outward support, even though there are a lot of people who feel unsupported. 
Do you think that this legislation has affected the school environment and the feeling of the safety for students' lives? I definitely feel like it's going in that direction. Um, Because like I said, well, UF hasn't like specifically like cut any studies or anything like that. There are a lot of things that people are just asking for that they're not doing, like trying to increase gender neutral bathrooms in campus, just general things to protect the students. And especially with the direction that UF has been going with literally firing all the DEI, like full-time officers and closing that office a lot of people are like afraid of what that's going to mean for things like gender studies and protections for like lgbtq plus students on campus and you know first day after black history month they closed the di and fired everybody so a lot of people believe that it has to do with relations between people on the board of trustees and uh, ben sass who's the president and stuff with desantis of course the students strongly disagree We need to listen to people and their personal experiences with these barriers to living an authentic life without censorship. I completely agree with you, Maria. But as difficult as things are on university campuses, they're even more dicey in high schools. As somebody who grew up in Florida while these new discriminatory laws were implemented by Governor DeSantis, I know firsthand that it's a scary place to be in. Let's look into this a bit more. For starters, speaking about gender and sexuality in any course or acknowledging a student's sexuality is prohibited in any classroom setting. In the beginning, the Don't Say Gay bill only affected children in kindergarten through third grade. But now, it affects students all the way up to 12th grade. Because of this, there have been many personal accounts from students and research done by the Williams Institute that show that LGBTQ identifying students' mental health rates are decreasing and there's an increased hostility towards them as well. By creating a school environment that is not accepting and inclusive to all students of all identities, we are putting so many children at risk. Let's talk a little bit about House Bill 1557, which critics call the Don't Say Gay Bill. You've been critical of that bill. Can you talk about that? Well, I have a a long background of working with the LGBTQ community and Equality Florida. I thought we'd made some progress, both in our training and understanding of how to reach out and support these students. I don't like the bullying that I see sometimes either online or in schools. Do you think this bill contributed to that? I think this bill contributes to it greatly because now teachers feel that their hands are tied. If a teacher is gay, he or she shouldn't have a picture on their desk showing their family. Since I was recently a high school student myself, I decided to speak to one of my high school teachers and see how they would be affected by these laws. They have asked to remain anonymous to protect themselves. I reside in Florida and I am a teacher, a high school history teacher. I have been employed in this school district for 19 years. So now, as you know, the Don't Say Gay Bill or the Parental Rights and Education Act was passed in 2022 and has expanded into high school education over the past year. How has this bill influenced your day-to-day life? as in how you teach, how you act in the classroom, how you exist in the classroom and in the larger school environment overall. Yeah, there's this term called a a chilling effect that I I think is a a very good term to describe how I feel. It's even if I've never been formally censored or formally had discussions with management or anything, um, just the very existence of it as as a teacher makes me like second guess of kind of self regulate and self police um, things that that I say or think. I like to be lighthearted and flippant and make jokes and be irreverent and and it kind of makes you second guess some of them and and you're afraid to kind of go there. Um, that's that's the first thing I think. But 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 it it's. It's just scary because there's no we've never been given any real instruction on on what is and isn't. So we were never given any guidance. And and basically, we were just kind of told, be careful uh, when you go out there. Um, I it's not the exact bill, but this year we had the strangest circumstance as far as um, you have to use someone's full legal name or you, you have to use their legal name. And um, again, I know this is a different bill. Um, And so obviously it seems the intent behind that is getting at, you know, calling someone by their dead name or their new name. And um, but but then there's just the practicality that very few people go by 
their exact given name. Um, but just in general, um, it's just scary being a teacher because you know you're just one slip up of of the, the tongue. And, and really, it doesn't have to be an actual slip up, but a perceived slip up uh, to, to being in serious trouble and, and um, kind of firsthand known and seen a lot of teachers get in trouble for things that are uh, really aren't very clear cut. So kind of just what I'm trying to say is it, it makes it almost like you are uh, – you're guilty until you're proven innocent. If someone says you instructed on gender ideology, you know, what would or gender identity or sexuality, you know, like I think as a teacher, that's one of my favorite things to do is just talk about these big historical figures as people and their everyday relationships. So um, it's a chilling effect. It, it creates this self censorship um, where you're just kind of scared. Um, so you just kind of feel unprotected out there. Um, you know, what is instruction? That's another thing that's really vague about the law. Or if like a student brings it up to me, am I supposed to comment on it? You know, obviously your sexuality or gender ideology or, or your personhood is, is something you carry with you all the time. And I carry with me all the time. And, um, how do we just like totally ignore that? Especially if I'm trying to describe the human condition as a history teacher and, um, that's that seems to be a uh, hard thing to uh, just totally ignore. I feel like you said a little bit about this in your answer, sure. but are there any terms or signs that you feel you must censor yourself in order to protect yourself from society or from the education board? I don't know if like there's an exact lesson I've ever like just thrown away per se. But it's just this freedom, this openness that um, I like to be as authentic as I can when I'm a teacher and just be myself. And it just kind of makes you, I guess, boring, which in some ways, I, at least I thought that should be that's one of the worst things you can be as a teacher is boring, because um, at least history is a very exciting topic in, in my book. So it, it just kind of gnaws at you and, and, you know, you're just kind of one mistake away from kind of like everything falling apart there. So, and, and you just kind of know, you don't feel like you're supported as far as you don't feel like you're administrators and you definitely know the department of education and the school district and all these people, like I said, they've never given me any real instruction on what to and not to say, but, but yeah, it just kind of feels like a setup, all of it to, uh, Another way kind of for teachers to to get in trouble. And it just always feels like we're kind of being blamed for most of society's problems um, and, and not be given the tools and, and really the power and responsibility to um, change a lot of the things either. So um, that's that's just to go back to it. Um, yeah, just a chilling effect on censorship where you're just kind of afraid to say what you're thinking at that moment. We're making this podcast for English speakers and listeners around the world. What do you want our listeners to know about what is going on in Florida regarding these legislations and political atmosphere? I, you just, you feel personally attacked and, and you try not to personalize things, but um, that's how it's felt in the past 20 years, being a teacher in Florida. As we are reflecting on this new form of oppression and discrimination in Florida, we need to use what we have learned and take action. Making this podcast made us realize that we have to pay more attention to what's going on at the state level, but also educate ourselves about how these attacks are happening across the globe. We deserve to have freedom of speech and the ability to be comfortable in our own identities in school. We cannot go backwards. We have to do everything in our power to resist the anti-gender movement in Florida and everywhere. The momentum for equality and justice is there, even if the road ahead looks tough. So let's keep talking about these issues, raising awareness, and pushing back against discrimination in all its forms. Because this isn't just about the courts and the evangelicals and the politics. It's about people's lives. Thank you for listening. Wow, that is absolutely terrifying. That was L, Christian, Adriana, and Maria on Florida's political debates on gender. Next up, Let's explore Germany. Hi, I'm Yanis Kastner. And I'm Agmar Eliezis Jr. We are students in feminist theory. 
and we made this segment of the podcast for our class. We decided to look at Germany because it has a pretty interesting anti-gender movement that's led by the Alternative for Deutschland, or also IFD party. Though currently the most radically right-placed party in the parliament, the party itself is headed by a lesbian, Alice Weidel. Germany, like many European countries, has witnessed the rise of right-wing populist movements in recent years. Among them, the AFD has emerged as a significant political force, garnering attention both domestically and internationally. But what fuels the popularity of the AFD, and how does it intersect with the anti-gender discourse? Founded in 2013, the AFD quickly rose to prominence on a platform opposing the euro currency and advocating for a return to the Deutschmark. However, what truly catapulted them into the spotlight was their stance on immigration and national identity. With slogans like Germans first, they tapped into growing concerns about multiculturalism and the perceived erosion of traditional German values. The AFD's rise reflects a broader trend of right-wing populist movements gaining traction across Europe, challenging the political establishment and reshaping the debate on issues ranging from immigration to globalization. In Germany, an old threat with a changing face. The far right has been named the biggest danger to democracy here. To understand the AfD's appeal, I interviewed my parents for a personal look into the party to explore how the AfD's often extreme right and possibly even neo-fascist ideas sound to my parents, who are in some way very ordinary Germans. My parents are both in their 50s now, working for a local communal government. My father is a carpenter employed by the city, and so is my mother, who is active as the treasurer of our town. They both were born and raised in our town of Malch in the south of Germany, and have much more contact with refugees and any migrant to Germany than other inhabitants of our town. In some way, I see them as a connecting piece between the general public and those most in need of our acknowledgement. Why is the AfD so popular? So, they were never a topic as long as Germany felt economically stable. I believe they only gained traction when, well, economically things weren't quite so good anymore. And then many people suddenly became afraid and thought, oh no, we brought in so many foreign people, so much money is being poured into supporting them. They can't contribute as much to our system. They're taking something away from us. And then someone comes along and maybe says, or they essentially imply, they're the culprits, even though that's crazy. As the conversation with Giannis's mother reveals, the AFD isn't always a first choice party for more of a protest vote. Yet many Germans do believe that this party will save Germany. To delve deeper into the relationship between the German AFD party, the anti-gender movement, and radical right populism, let's turn to Professor Ralph Havertz's research on right-wing extremism and populism. Havertz argues that the AfD sees the traditional family as the center of the nation. For the AfD, the traditional family is threatened by migration, especially of people from majority Muslim countries. Further, he goes on to say that any lifestyle that diverts from the model of the traditional family is dismissed as a deviation that has to be suppressed. Ironically, the AfD often uses gay rights and women's rights to create a narrative about a progressive and civilized Germany versus a backwards and barbaric Islam. Parties like the AfD often use women's rights and LGBTQIA plus rights to show Germany as superior to the supposedly homophobic and misogynist Muslim world. Yet, what is most interesting about the party is the gay following it gathered, not to mention that the party itself is represented by a lesbian, Alice Weidel. Often the AfD uses fear of demographic shifts to scare ethnic Germans. 2016 campaign used the slogan, more children instead of mass immigration and played up the fact that the ethnic German birth rate is lower than the birth rate among migrants. The political topics of this party aren't actually substantial, quite the opposite. They just make politics simple, like Germans first or America first. Those are all slogans that are easy to grasp. 
This right-wing populist party, like right-wing parties in other European countries and in the U.S., plays on fears about migration to consolidate its power. And then we come back to the fact that people feel rooted in their national pride as citizens, no matter which country, be it in Hungary, be it Poland, be it the Czech Republic, everyone feels so rooted. They come to see their country as their position and their pride. And this right-wing populist party, they actually only make successful politics now because the world is getting more, or Europe. I mean, I don't know if flooded is the right word, but getting more and more influx from foreign cultures and simply the system that reigns in Europe with taxes and equality and socially is shaken because of it. And that's why the party is getting such an increase, because many voters say, maybe only even in thoughts, hey, I don't like that either. But the voters who practically favor the AFT here in spirit or in the sense, that's the main reason and not the political topics, because they actually don't have any other major domestic topics because tax money or taxation of the wealthy or such things, well, that changes from party to party. Those are all topics that wouldn't excite them. The rise of right-wing populist parties in Europe can be attributed to a variety of factors, but one of the main drivers is the perceived threat of immigration and the cultural changes it brings. Many people feel that their national identity and pride are under threat due to increased multiculturalism and globalization. These parties often capitalize on fears and anxieties about the changing demographics of their countries, portraying themselves as defenders of national sovereignty and cultural heritage. While they may not always offer concrete policy solutions, right-wing populist parties excel at tapping into the emotions and frustrations of voters who feel marginalized or left behind by mainstream politics. Issues like immigration and national identity become rallying cries for these parties overshadowing other policy debates and allowing them to gain support by appealing to people's sense of belonging and security. One thing the interview with my parents illustrates is that support for a party like the IFD is not always about populism, but about protest sense of frustration with the current neoliberal economic order. What we must recognize in this is that their points of concerns are not always wrong, but more often misguided. Integration in Germany has been a failure that has driven migrants in German small part than it has united them since the inception of what once was called the welcome culture. To think even of mass deportation seems to many a final solution to what appears to be an unsolvable issue. Yet, what can be heard from an interview with my parents is that the migrant crisis, so-called, is rather understood as an economical issue. We propose a reassessment of not where the money is going, but who is profiting from the so-called migrant crisis. We need to rethink not just where the money is going or shouldn't go, but who is paying the cost of this crisis. It's no shock that the IFD aims to make life harder for workers while cutting taxes for the richest. The AfD is also playing on fears, spreading misinformation, and stirring up fascist-like excitement among folks looking for quick fixes after traditional methods have failed. It's no accident that their leader is a lesbian. This plays into fears of aggressive, hypersexual Muslim men sparking homo-nationalist sentiments. This makes some white queers feel like they're a part of the right-wing radical crowd believing that their safety is being considered too. The division is about race, not queerness, even though it also uses gender and sexuality to separate people. The fact that the AFD doesn't have any queer-focused policies shows that they see the problem as racial, viewing anti-queer violence as something foreign. The AFD is really just using its voters to boost the wealth of their lobbyists. Despite the scary anti-Muslim and anti-gender views of the party, maybe this urge to protest could be redirected towards a feminist kind of populism, like what we've seen in Poland. On the question of a queer or trans person holding office, the following obstruction was presented by our interviewees, confirming that the IFD's persuasions are even tempting the most common representative of German society that has never even considered voting for them. 
For example, not so long ago I had a conversation with a doctor who thought it was terrible that Germany had a gay foreign minister. Because the office of a foreign minister should be held in high esteem in the eyes of the people he or she meets. Perhaps when he or she appears in Arab countries or represents his or her own country. And that is simply not yet the case. It's the same issue when gender people are in political office. You still see the representative and perhaps also the body size. Oh, he's actually much too short. We actually need a person who makes a bit of an impression. And I think that's difficult because people still have prejudices. Perhaps they so don't trust a woman with the role. We now have a Ms. von der Leyen. What a high position she has. President of the European Union. But she is still sometimes portrayed as mummy. You would never dare to do that with a man. Somehow this thought is, there must be a seasoned man. But that's totally stupid. But I think it's like this. If you go to Arab countries and someone appears there now, who who perhaps as a gay person or, or a trans person, you don't even know, how do you address this person now? You might get the feeling that they won't take you seriously or something. Although this is actually totally stupid. I also don't believe that a person whose gender identity is ambiguous would really be elected by the people. Society simply isn't ready for that yet. It will take a few more years. Talking with family who don't agree with you on issues such as gay and trans rights can be tough, but also really important. When Giannis chatted with his parents, I started to get why they were drawn to the AFD's anti-gender messages. They're feeling the pinch from global capitalism and climate change, just like everyone else. Add in the so-called refugee crisis, fewer chances for work in his hometown, even for locals, and all these new social norms, and it's clear why they feel so vulnerable and scared. The AFD gives them a simple us versus them story, pinning traditional values against gender ideologies. The big question is how we keep these talks going and help our loved ones see who the real enemy is. It's not trans people or immigrants. It's the failing systems built by capitalism and nationalism. But figuring that out with his folks and my folks will have to wait for another chat. Thanks, Giannis and Akbar Ali. The entire Alternative for Deutschland movement and its lesbian leader, Alice Weibel, is what I like to call girl boss fascism. Last but not least, let's take a trip to Mexico. Hello, I'm Christina Ritter, and I'm a sophomore at Middlebury College. And I'm Nancy Rivera, and I'm a sophomore at Middlebury College. For our segment of the podcast, we decided to look at the anti-gender movement in Mexico. In part, that's because I'm from Mexico, and I still have very close connections with it. Mexico, like all countries, is a space of contradictions. On the one hand, Mexico has one of the most progressive and feminist legal landscapes in the world. On the other hand, this is not exactly how women and other feminized bodies experience their lives. Femicides have surged since 2015, even as a federal constitution enshrines abortion rights and same-sex marriage promises a more feminist future. What we are seeing in Mexico is a struggle between feminist forces and an anti-gender ideology movement that in some ways is a response to this more feminist legal landscape and in other ways has very deep roots in the Catholic Church and the culture of Mexico. In this segment, we speak to Yvonne Serna, a climate and social justice activist based in Mexico City about the feminist and anti-gender movements in Mexico. We're diving into the complex world of feminism and femicides with one key question in mind. How can we square away the surge in femicides since 2015 with the legal strides towards gender equality in recent years? Yvonne started off by telling me about her hometown and how gender politics didn't really come up in conversation much while growing up. When same-sex marriage was first brought into the picture, it was brought in exclusively for Mexico City. Uh, as many of the most progressive laws in Mexico have also um, done, it is in Mexico City that uh, the majority of, let's say, the most progressive population or 
I would say the most progressive politicians sort of like lie together. At the beginning, it wasn't something that we really talked a lot about in in the provinces, but over time it grew. I would say it started to be really a part of sort of like the general debate at around 2015, 2016 perhaps, um, which is when uh, President Enrique Peña Nieto made the proposition to do a constitutional amendment so that it would not only be legal, same-sex marriage, in Mexico City, but that it would extend um, to the entire country. And this is when things really exploded because, uh, as you may know, Mexico is still in many ways a very conservative country. It's also Mm -hmm. a very religious country. Even, I would say, like hate speech coming from religious groups towards um, people that either identify um, with non-binary genders or also people that are trying to get legally married in a same-sex couple. So most of the discourse that happened around then was still very negative, you know? So like Yvonne says, it was President Pina Nieto's actions for gay marriage that helped spur the anti-gender movement in Mexico like the National Front for the Family, headed by Rodrigo Cortez. Recently, Cortez was brought to court after consistently misgendering a fellow lawmaker on Twitter. He explained in a commercial ad for ADF International, the alliance defending freedom. As a civil society leader and former congressman from Mexico, I share my opinion on Twitter about a bill aimed to penalize Christian teaching on sexuality as a form of hate speech We are all made male or female, men or women. And for speaking my convictions on this truth, I was charged and convicted under the law for multiple forms of violence, including digital violence, for speaking out about the objective truth that there are only two genders, male and female. I was censored. With the help of Cortez ADF says he's just stating the objective facts of science while also expressing his religious beliefs that sex cannot be changed. By saying that gender is purely biological, Cortez can tap into Article 3 of the Mexican Constitution, which advocates for secular and scientific education. But even though groups like the National Front for the Family are gaining momentum, Yvonne points out that Mexico's cultural landscape is shifting. Um, there is a lot of coalitions that work together to sort of like push back um, in any set of like progressive gender agenda. But what is really interesting now in the 2020s is that as our generation is is growing older, is gaining um, sort of like a stronger political voice. And our generation, I'm talking about people that were either born in like the 90s or early. 2000s, much of this discourse is starting to change. And you see that people, young people in the like vast majority, I mean, it's not all of them, of course, but the vast majority of young people are more aware, I think, of, of gender issues and are supporting just more and more the fact that, you know, gender doesn't have to look in one way and like, there is many other forms of marriage rather than just the traditional one that we've been sort of like sold our entire life. So you start to see it more in, in, in conversations in the public and sort of like popular culture as well. Whereas now, at least in the city, because it's not the same in the provinces, it's something that has become accepted as part of, oh yeah, like that makes sense. That doesn't mean that everybody is agreeing with it because again it's still a country that is founded upon very (laughs) traditional like religious values but i have a lot of hope i think the younger people really see the necessity of doing changes that protect people of all genders that are based in law and not only social acceptance yvonne's hope for the future stands as a stark contrast to the increased rise in femicides but it also helps demonstrate how strong the feminist movement in Mexico has become in recent years, with Yvonne describing how. As a young girl, again, growing up in, in, in the province, 
it used to be something that was demonized, you know, like an us versus them description. And yeah. I think right now in many parts of the province as well, like not the urban centers, it's it's becoming just more and more accepted. Like, oh, I mean, this makes sense. And perhaps I don't agree with everything, but I mean, it makes sense. I feel like there is this sort of like sorority that has been building over, over the past few years. Also, because in Mexico, we have a lot of issues with um, feminicide. So the assassination of, of women, uh, yeah. kidnapping of women. And so the fact that all of these issues have also become more uh, publicized, you know, like the media is talking more and more about this, uh, has woken up this idea of like, oh, we need to like unite to, to fight against it in, in, in our generation. Vaughn's take on the growing strength of the feminist movement really shines a light on how much it's expanded lately. But it's not just about that. She also points out how groups like the Front for the Family have been gaining steam since 2016. There's this interesting point that scholar Ann Wilkinson makes saying that some conservative groups see laws promoting gender equality as a direct threat to the heteronormative family, and that this failing family structure is leading to an increase in violence, like femicides. Through this reframing of security as a moral issue, pro-family activists can redirect their anxieties about the increase in violence in Mexico with moral concerns for gender and the family, all while avoiding the root cause of skyrocketing femicides. So when asked about femicides and how they tie into security, Yvonne had some insightful thoughts. I think this aspect of like security and femicide is something that it's just so like strongly discussed these days um, over here that I think, I mean, especially amongst women, there is this recognition of like, oh, like we're generally not safe, you know? And what's shocking is that it doesn't matter if you come from like the fanciest, neighborhood in the city or if you come you know from like rural areas there is this consensus of like just your gender you are more vulnerable or susceptible to x and x thing so i think the discussion on security is very strong uh there again particularly within women i think it's slowly extending you know to like the rest of of society So we have these right-wing politicians who are all about the traditional family values, right? They see gender as a big moral and security issue. But here's the thing. While they're busy fighting against gender-based equality, it's women, especially those most at risk of violence, like femicides, who are really feeling the heat. Yvonne's experiences help show how femicides affect all women, even though indigenous and lower income are at exasperated risk of being killed. And it's not just about passing laws anymore. Even if the government's dragging its feet, Yvonne tells me how many feminists are stepping up their game in response to the increased violence. She explained how... In a state that is so fraud, like, its citizens don't really trust it. I'm talking about the Mexican state. So you feel that the only people that you can trust in is each other, and that's why there is also, I think, so many feminist collectives, so many... Um, I forgot the word for acompañamiento, but in Spanish, uh, there is a lot of like accompaniment collectives that are in charge of offering that aid that the state would in an ideal society give to women that are in, in, in situations of, of violence or that are facing, you know, like other type of security issues. Um, so I think it's very interesting, that idea of like creating hope from the lack of it. <laughs> We're yeah, creating sort yeah. of like action from the lack of action from, from government. As we look to the future, it's imperative to embrace Yvonne's optimism and recognize that future generations are the foundation of hope for Mexico's feminist future, despite the apparent strength of opposing entities like the National Front for the Family. Following the insights of scholars such as Veronica Gago, it is essential to focus on fostering feminist assemblies that foster inclusivity and offer diverse activities and initiatives for all, thus charting a progressive path forward. The evolving culture in Mexico serves as a beacon for other nations, urging them to observe and emulate the strides made by its flourishing feminist movement. As we approach the upcoming June election, Mexico stands positioned for a female-led future. Mexico's electoral race is heating up. Two women are eyeing to become the next president of Mexico. 
It's a historic first for Mexico. Two women at the forefront of the country's presidential primaries. Looking ahead, June will unveil the victor and shed light on their approach to pressing issues like the gender pay gap, femicides, and reproductive rights. It's important to embrace Yvonne's optimism for a feminist future, but we must also realize that this feminist movement doesn't necessarily touch all women's lives, as we will see in our next segment. Hi, it's Nancy again, and in this segment, I talk to my mother, who is also Nancy. My mom currently resides in California, but is originally from Monterrey, Nuevo León, in Mexico. Over the years, she has experienced life in both the United States and Mexico. This has given her a deep understanding of the structural barriers faced by women, particularly in Mexico, and she is very aware of how sexism has shaped her life. As Christina started explaining, my mother's conversation presents an intriguing juxtaposition with the feminist optimism of Yvonne. We can hear from her story just how profoundly both sexism and her deeply rooted Catholicism shaped both her identity and her skepticism about Mexico's future. I began by asking Nancy about the day-to-day -day life of women in Mexico and their roles in the households. Day-to-day life is very traditional, depending on what you do. Whether you're a housewife or if you have a job, it's totally different. Also depends on the region of the country where you live. As Nancy points out, gender roles for women can depend on where you live since each region has its own cultural identity. She mentions her firsthand experience with the traditional gender roles and expectations placed on women. There was a great distinction between what was deemed acceptable for men and women. Through our interview, Nancy places a strong emphasis on family and domestic duties for women. Women like herself were and are still currently expected to prioritize caregiving and homemaking over pursuing education or a career. Some women do have the opportunity to work outside the home, but that often becomes very limited due to societal expectations and norms. If we're talking, for example, about my experience in the workplace, it hasn't been very good in terms of employment. Almost always, being a woman means you can't advance in your position. You can't earn the same as a man, and you have to endure harassment. In my experience, I was promoted to a position in a large store, and what happened is that all the staff, all the employees there started to talk, saying that I was involved with the store manager, and it was all because I'm a woman. Men think that a woman shouldn't be in a higher and more prominent position than them. Nancy recounted her personal experience in the workplace, revealing the challenges she encountered and the instances of harassment she endured while in the labor force. Having worked since the age of 12, Nancy reflects on the harsh realities of being a working woman in Mexico, but also shares her experience beyond the workplace, encompassing her experiences as a woman in this society, where simply being out in public as a woman automatically put the target on your back. When being asked if she had ever been harassed by a man in public, Nancy's emotional response was telling. Yeah, going to work, I always took public transportation. In public, my bag was stolen, and in these cases, no one intervened to defend me. It's not just one person who robs you. It's usually about three men who just take your wallet, and everyone watches, and no one defends you. Everyone stays silent, especially women. When you're on a bus and someone is groping you, you just have to stand up and move. Or when someone leans on you inappropriately, it's the same. You have to find a way to defend yourself. It's very common harassment in public. They can grope you. They can do things to you. It's sad. No one defends you. Everyone stays silent, especially women. The conversation with Nancy delves deeper into the concept of machismo and the impact this has on women in Mexico. She describes machismo as a concept that emphasizes the traditional masculine traits and overall male superiority over women. Nancy explains that machismo is deeply ingrained in Mexican culture, shaping societal expectations and norms regarding gender. Nancy highlights how machismo manifests in all aspects of her life. In the labor force, Nancy says, Machismo can be seen in the stories I mentioned before. In our culture, traditional gender roles are followed whether it be within your family, the labor force, or even in public. There is this sense of toxic masculinity where you do as the men say, and because of this, many women face many limitations. Men see themselves as superior just because they're men. 
And as a woman, you have to be subordinate to them. Just because you're a woman, you, you have to. While in a traditional household, typically, the man is the one who holds authority and who makes the decisions, even if it's wrong. It's the man because it has always been that way. In my experience and from what I've seen around me, there's a lot of violence against women. You have to stay quiet because that's the cultural norm, and it's terrible. Men always have the final say. According to Nancy, this cultural dynamic has created widespread violence against women. Many of these women feel pressure to tolerate such behavior and many fear speaking out due to societal stigma or retaliation. This is an ongoing cycle that Nancy has seen generation over generation. Nancy noted that while Catholicism once held a central place in Mexican culture, Based on her observations, there have been cultural and technological shifts that are distancing the people from religion. In other words, younger generations are spending all their time on their devices, not listening carefully to what the church thinks about gender. When asked if this could potentially benefit these generations, Nancy's response was very straightforward. Well, yes, it could help them to some extent, like if the generations decrease a bit of machismo but I think they lose a bit of the value regarding family. The departure from traditional values prompts Nancy to express concerns about the potential loss of familial connections. Nancy's desire to maintain traditional values can be directly linked to her upbringing and the influence of the Catholic Church on her life. Nancy was exposed to the teachings of the Church from a very early age. She says she has been a Catholic since she can remember. As a little girl, she went to church every Sunday, having to wear her hair covering because at the time in Mexico, women were not allowed to be inside the church without it. She says she has been a Catholic since she can remember. My mom's commitment to caregiving roles and her views on gender dynamics within Mexican society all reflect the traditional values taught by the Catholic Church. Additionally, Nancy's reluctance to embrace certain aspects of feminism may stem from her deeply held religious beliefs. While she recognizes the need for progress and equality, her faith and the cultural norms she grew up with may lead her to resist certain changes that challenge traditional values. But like all of us, Nancy is a complex person. She doesn't just accept the church teachings without resistance. After all, she let me go to a fairly progressive college in the Northeast, where I take courses like feminist theory and learn all about the church's war on gender. And perhaps that is a cause for optimism about a more feminist future. And that was Nancy and Christina, and of course, Nancy's mom, Nancy. Well, that was my feminist theory class. Big thank you to all my students for making this podcast. I also want to thank the Provost Academic Council for providing funding, especially Lisa LaRose and Michelle McCauley for all their help. Special shout out to Harper Nichols, Elle Fahey, and as always, Allison Seeger for all the editing, and Julian Seeger-Reed for sound engineering. I also want to thank Johnny Melly for making a quiet place for us to record. Thanks for listening, everyone. I think it's pretty obvious from the projects that my students did that the anti-gender ideology movement is everywhere and that as feminist theorists and activists, we better pay attention to it because it is certainly paying attention to us. If you want to hear more about Mexico City, we've got several episodes in the works coming to you this summer. So give us a like and follow along on our website and streaming platforms to stay up to date on new episodes. We've got some exciting things coming up.